ready. One day, I will tell you there are no new cases. And I'll read that the Nightingale is closing down. We'll take time to reflect and remember those lives lost. And we'll hug our loved ones. Our kids will play with their friends and finally go back to school. We will see our colleagues again. Sport will return, whether you like it or not. Cafes, shops and cinemas will open their doors. One day, plans will be made and kept. And until then, we'll be here to help you understand what's happening every step of the way. Good afternoon. There's the, an example of the BBC being positive uh, and at the same time boosting itself and hoping for more viewers in the, in the, niece, in the recent future. I, I think this is today an attempt to launch a book, one of these bite-sized books, which has been produced incredibly quickly by John Mayer, uh, The Virus and the Media with lots of chapters uh, pretty rapidly written, a first draft of history, uh, attempting to make some sense of the relationship between the media uh, and, the, and what's happened with the virus, uh, how it was covered, what the effects of it are uh, on media. Um, and so we're going to start, um, well, first of all, let me, before I do that, let me introduce the fact that we've got a rather uh, wonderful panel um, uh, we're going to have Douglas McCabe in a second or two uh, with a, a pre-prepared uh, film. We're then going to have Paul Conyu, Conyu, who's a media commentator and a former editor of the Sunday Mirror, deputy editor of the News of the World, deputy editor of various places, I think. Um, we're hoping to get Damien Collins, who I hope is on his way, hot foot now from the Commons. Oh, in fact, I see him in the background. Damien, Damien is with us, thank goodness for that. Akhil Ahmed will be here, uh, former head of religion at the BBC uh, and at Channel 4. Uh, and David K. Johnson, uh, our sort of star Pulitzer Prize winning uh, contributor who is an expert, uh, and I do mean an expert, on Donald Trump. Uh, having followed him over 30 years, um, it's a wonder that he hasn't got the biggest headache of us all. Anyway, let's start, uh, before we meet our panel individually, let's start with a, with a film here that's been made by Douglas McCabe of Ender's Analysis. Uh, Douglas uh, is, uh, it's a market research firm, but he really uh, concentrates on, on the media um, and is probably the most eminent analyst after myself uh, on the media. So take it away, Douglas. Thank you. I will start by highlighting uh, four structural themes that Enders Analysis has been talking about in its research program for ages, um, but that are being massively accelerated through the, through the pandemic. Um, one is retail to e-commerce, particularly affects the press because it's it's you know it's a it's a double whammy of yeah, retail advertising on the one side and physical distribution on the other, uh, offline to online consumption and advertising. Uh, online advertising is now more than fifty percent of all spend, rapidly moving towards sixty percent. Um, the rise of the user online economy is is good news for some parts of the news industry in the longer term, but the sheer speed with which uh, things are moving makes it incredibly difficult for. Uh, for businesses at the foothills of, of developing a, an impulse purchase or subscription model to really exploit that, uh, you know, quickly. Uh, and then finally, the, 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 the shift from a global economy and global values to um, a lo local economies and local values, um, which, is, which is a reversal of something that's been going on for many, for many decades. There are three types of, three types of recession. Um, we don't seriously believe that there is a bounce back uh, that is going to be rapid. We're more inclined towards this recession turning into a depression. We probably want to develop a new letter that isn't quite an L, not quite as bad as an L. Obviously, parts of the economy are going to come back, but some parts of the economy are going to be uh, depressed in deep recession for quite considerable time. Think about tourism being perhaps the obvious example. Um, in terms of news media and recessions, we've, we've, we've mar marched three or four in this chart over the last uh, 30 years or so. 
40 years, uh, and um, the, the, you know, there's a steady decline. The bounce backs are sort of weaker uh, as, as, as time passes. We think this one will feel particularly, uh, particularly tricky, and we expect somewhere around half to two-thirds of the, of the money that was coming in the door pre-recession, uh, sorry, pre-pandemic, uh, to be coming through the door um, come 2021. But it might take even longer than that for that money to come back. It's going to be quite difficult to very precisely uh, forecast how that will how that will play out. We've done a top-down um, set of uh, assumptions to come up with the numbers that we've um, we've identified here. Uh, and here we are talking about the national newspaper industry, the local newspaper industry, the magazine industry. So we're talking about the entire the entire print space. And as you can see, an extraordinary £750 million of print revenue, print advertising revenue, sorry, and a couple of hundred million pounds of online. Um, advertising revenue on top, uh, falling out of the space well over a billion pounds, or well over 25, or a bit over 25 percent of the total, uh, the total revenue of the sector as a whole, uh, falling away. And we're also identifying that 5,000 frontline journalists, about a third, about a third of frontline journalists, uh, are now more at risk uh, than they were before the pandemic. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a very controversial thing to, to say. Um, we've used. Um, um, uh, Twitter as a way of uh, uh, illustrating just what's going on in terms of um, in, in, in terms of the economics of of, of, of content supply. Um, not because this isn't true of all news media, because it absolutely is true of all news media. But Twitter just had uh, very very specific data immediately available. They had 25% rise in users, something that they would celebrate at any normal time, of course. But equally, uh, a, 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 an almost matching decline in revenue and an overall collapse in ARPU. This is exactly what's going on across the content and media space, generally speaking. I wanted to talk just very briefly about the sheer scale of the online advertising market, now well over 50% of spend. It's going to land at 60% of spend or thereabouts as we come out of this pandemic. Google and Facebook and, and rapidly growing um, Amazon really, um, um, re really kind of huge players in this market, defining the market, defining the trading terms of the market and the news industry ha has gone from uh, the entire print media if you like has gone from a being a 50 percent player 20 years ago to a, a three percent player uh, today and uh, and and is further eroding one of the big themes of the last uh, few years has been the rise of smes they've driven very much driven the expansion in, in google and facebook advertising 800,000 companies have been formed in the uk over the last 15 years um, but during the last recession, uh, growth in SMEs continued, even if it did significantly slow. I'm talking about that period, 2008, 9, 10. Um, no one seriously believes, I think, in 2020, 21, uh, that SME, uh, uh, SMEs will continue to grow. The reality is they will, they will fall away significantly for the first time in a very, very long time. Um, the size of SME spend across um, Facebook and Google uh, is shown here highlighting just the, the, the huge degree to which it has completely drowned out the local press's um, um, ad spend. And there's also a kind of cultural issue that I wanted to touch upon, um, that advertising has been so important uh, for, for, for many um, big publishing businesses, news businesses, uh, and media businesses uh, over the last 40 years. Uh, I think what's easy to forget is that there was there was a short window of 20 years from 1985 where where advertising was so important to these to these businesses, uh, but for 100 years before that it was not important, and it's going to be in reality a lot less important going forward. One of the big themes I talked about was the was the um, rise and rise of local. I think this is both an opportunity for media uh, going forward. It's extremely important to I think to 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 simply identify that this is an important. Important theme. It's an important change in the way that the UK uh, economy is developing. Um, it will also be challenging uh, in many ways to exploit it, um, but it's very important for local media. And I finish with our interventions, or the recommended interventions rather that we made to uh, DCMS and ultimately the Treasury. Two of them, two of the easy ones, have kind of flowed through so far. We'd very much welcome more of these coming through. Perhaps particularly number three in support of SMEs and local media. Thank you. Uh, well, panel, I wonder if there are, all of you are crying now. Um, that's a very depressing picture, uh, I have to say. 
Um, before um, I ask you to contribute your thoughts on anything else, uh, Paul, let me ask you how you react to what um, Douglas has said there. Very, very depressing. I think uh, among the casualties of the COVID crisis are going to be you know, quite a number of local and regional newspapers and many thousands of journalists' jobs, which is, which is, which is in fact a disaster in terms of their livelihoods and, of, of course, holding uh, power to account. Damien, how do you react to that? I wonder, you know, you're coming at this uh, as a politician. Um, and you are not necessarily somebody who's uh, going to suffer yourself uh, from th this kind of downturn, but I wonder how you react to what Douglas had to say. Well, it's extremely uh, concerning, and I agree with the analysis that what I think the coronavirus recession is going to do is accelerate trends that were already evident in society, and I think the shift to online retail from the high streets, uh, the decline of ad revenue, the impact on print media as a consequence of that. Those trends have been with us for a while, but they've been massively accelerated as a consequence of this. And I think it also throws up a big dilemma, not just in terms of the future of the news industry, uh, but also the way it exists within a, an, an online environment where disinformation and hate speech increasingly thrives. But many people now will, will regard social media is one of the channels through which they get their news and information. Uh, and that may be their starting point for looking at news online. And they see not a curated piece of news content that an editor or producer has gone through to prepare using their experience to select what they think is the most important information that someone needs to know, but that job being done by an algorithm. And so I think the, the double threat to democracy we face at the moment is the economic decline of the news media um, which we mean there were fewer journalists investigating fewer important stories and that has an impact on the whole society. But the journalism itself gets lost in this online swirl of disinformation and other radical uh, hate speech. And as, as people increasingly use YouTube and um, Facebook and channels like to get their news, I think we should also regard as sinister and concerning the steady drumbeat of attack on mainstream media. You know, from you know, I think I think really got going in by Donald Trump really got this going in America, it's sitting in the UK as well, which is you know, trying to turn the people against the press. I mean, the press is part of the problem. Their you know questions, their scrutiny is damaging and unwelcome, and they should be attacked. And I can't think of it you know, for a democracy to have a there to be a mainstream argument in democracy that the media is part of the problem is a very very unhealthy place to be. And I think. Again, this crisis seems to be accelerating right. that. Okay, I'm going to uh, come back to you about that um, when you do your contribution in terms of social media. Uh, for the moment, I'm going to move on uh, by asking Paul to make his central contribution. Um, Paul, as I say, edited the Sunday Mirror uh, and has held senior executive positions at various newspapers and has emerged uh, into the world of media commentating. Uh, okay, Paul, take it away. Well, today is the 150th anniversary of Charles Dickens' death, which is rather appropriate because many times during this crisis, the opening lines of A Tale of Two Cities actually struck me. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. And I think we've seen a combination of some of the best of British journalism and some of the worst in, you know, in covering the COVID crisis. I mean... There's also been times when I've felt as if I've been transported, this is early on, to a personality cult nation on a par with Putin's Russia, Kim's North Korea, Bolsonaro's Brazil, and the badlands of, um, of the Trump hardcore base. But I think that's wearing off a bit, because I think the, you know, the personality cult of Boris Johnson is evaporating somewhat along with his collapsing poll ratings, the public trust stats, and that new YouGov poll putting the British government's COVID crisis hand in joint bottom of the world trust table. And you're, you know, we're seeing sound of even normally loyal Tory newspapers, you know, going comparatively quiet, in fact, on their cheerleading and sometimes healthily critical. I mean, 
The Daily Express remains a sort of loyalist outlier. outlier. I mean, their front page on the day Boris emerged from his uh, self-induced COVID you know, hospital encounter. Yeah, their front page was, you know, played like a combination of the second coming, the resurrection of Churchill, and Moses descending from the mat with tablets of stone that would crush the virus beneath uh, the weight of, uh, of Boris's overhyped charisma. I mean, frankly, if it... It would be a great classic edition of the thick of it. If it weren't for the 60,000 dead, the despair of those losing loved ones in soul-destroying circumstances and the economic devastation that's been delivered by, by the virus. But I'd like to focus more on the more positive side of, uh, of how the press has performed, like hats off to the Sunday Times. We're not waiting for Boris to stumble back from his checkers convalescence to expose that early cavalier incompetence in, in that memorable April the 19th Insight special. And for revealing the Prime Minister had skipped five Cobra meetings on the COVID crisis to deal with certain intriguing and still not fully explained personal issues. Something the former gov government chief scientific advisor, Professor D Sir David King, argued simply wouldn't have happened under Theresa May, David Cameron, Gordon Brown or Tony Blair. Rumour has it that my old boss, Rupert Murdoch, and R Roy's old boss too, might be tempted to um, apply his private opinion of Donald Trump to Boris Johnson, a fucking idiot. Hats off too to The Guardian for revealing the Prime Minister's chief advisor, should that be Svengali puppeteer Dominic Cummings had been attending you know, the SAGE meet, advisory meetings. Hats off again to The Guardian, in alliance with The Mirror, for exposing Cummings as the lockdown rule maker to turn rule breaker. And I think Boris Johnson's refusal to sack him has undoubtedly been the catalyst for the sort of social distancing breakdown we've seen on beaches, parks, and of course, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. For me, there's another thick of it, the thick of it moment about watching cabinet ministers who justifiably demanded the head of Professor Neil Ferguson for breaching the lockdown rules with his, uh, with his uh, close encounter with his mistress. But then, then those same ministers have performed third rate contortion acts to try to defend Cummings, breaching, you know, his breaching trip to Durham where even the Daily Mail turned heavily on Cummings and it must have sent a shiver down Boris's spine, but not, not, not enough, alas, to remove Cummings from his, um, from his role at number 10. Hats off, too, to Newsnight's Emily Maitlis for those um, unforgettable monologues that's excoriating the government's COVID crisis handling, even if the BBC hierarchy did rush with indecent haste to... Um, to disown her to an extent after that number 10 complaint. And hats off too to the unlikely figure of Piers Morgan. For so long the bet noir of liberal opinion, but now suddenly it's hero with those colorful showboating combination of a genuinely forensic political interviewing and, a, and blood sports um, that scared off ministers from appearing on the ITV breakfast show. Uh, I think you're running out of hats now, um, Paul. Well, well, it, well, it should worry. Yes, it, I probably am. It should worry us, though, that uh, the Johnson coming at axis is so resentful of, of press scrutiny, and it's now effectively banning ministers from appearing on the more challenging broadcast pl platforms, Channel Four News, Good Morning Britain, and to a slightly lesser, lesser extent, only Newsnight. And after this morning, I think Kay Burley may be on their hit list after she. Um, forensically eviscerated the rather hapless care minister, Helen Waitley. But when a government whose COVID crisis strategy often looks like shambolic and thought up on the hoof, or designed Trump-like to hijack the news ag ag agenda or divert from it, it's frequently floated by those Tory titles still in the declining pleas to oblige category, although they're, they're reducing in number. Even the Telegraph isn't totally loyal to its uh, ex-columnist. And in our new book, The Brass and the Media, I've returned to a, our previous publication, Brexit, Boris and the Media, because there I, I had conversations with some senior Tories who privately expressed their fears that the Boris Dom show lacked the ability to transform their undoubted simplistic sloganising campaign talent into running a government, especially in a major crisis. How prophetic they, they, their fears are proving. It's good that the Cummings lockdown flouting furoris at least brought some of them out into the open. 
By the time the COVID crisis is finally over, you expect many more tourists might pluck up the, cur of the courage to come out and join them. Okay, thank you, Paul. Let me, David, um, uh, you, uh, Key, are you, uh, you, uh, you probably heard Paul mention there uh, some similarities between Boris and, uh, and Trump. Do you perceive these uh, as, as uh, or, or is Trump out on his own completely or is Boris, do you think, having Trump-like uh, kind of flights of fancy? Well, I think of uh, Boris Johnson as Donald Trump light with an actual education. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the inability to uh, grasp the necessary information to respond to this crisis uh, is really quite extraordinary. I mean, one of the things I've learned by watching a number of uh, British film clips and things over the last uh, four or five years is how really poorly informed Boris Johnson is. And of course, that is the core problem with Donald Trump. Uh, Donald truly believes in his own mind that he is the smartest person in the world. He knows more than anybody else. He should be in charge of everything. And if you don't recognize it, fake news. And mm -hmm. there are clips of Boris Johnson you know, being prepped before he says something. And all politicians get prepped. There's nothing wrong with that where it's clear that he has no clue about it in the same way that Donald Trump often has absolutely no clue to what's going on. Akil, can I ask you uh, how you respond to what Paul had to say? Do you, do you perceive uh, in, I mean, it, it seems to me uh, that Paul is probably not gonna vote Tory, but um, it, it seems to me a bit uh, one-sided his view of, uh, of the coverage of Boris, don't you think? Or do you think there's something to it? Well, um, the I'm, coverage I'm that I... Ackel, um, I was just asking Ackle, David, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go for it, Ackle. I think you're, I think <laughs> it's possible that your microphone is off, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there is some, um, I think there's some merit to what, what Paul says. But I think ultimately, you know, we got to understand that actually he's, he's incredibly popular with a lot of people. Uh, and I think that we, we sometimes struggle to get that. And, and we'd like, because the, the reality is he clearly, I think, you know, a lot of people would say that he's been found wanting in this situation. He hasn't got the level of detail that's required. Um, you know, this isn't necessarily the best cabinet that you could probably have got from the party itself. Uh, he, you know, so there are issues around his leadership and how slowly he took things to get. But actually, if you go out into various parts of the country, um, they still have this kind of like love for him. And for someone like myself, I mean, I, yeah, I'm from the northwest of England originally, and I spend a lot of time back in the north of England. And you think about that, that those, those seats that went conservative, um, you know, very, I mean, I remember in 83 when we had that blue landslide and there were certain seats that went conservative, but there was a large chunks of the North which still did not go. And they went this time because they voted for Boris. And I think with regards to the kind of like the coverage we've seen, I think there's an element of a, a bit of the keeping in the back of the mind of people that actually that people do like him, even though the rest of us can see all the failings, they just don't care about those failings because he's a character. You know, there are lots, Nigel Farage has lots of failings, but again, again he's very popular with these particular, with particular kind of people as well. And actually even with people from ethnic minorities, a lot of them have talked about Boris. They kind of like, like him. They use the, they call him Boris. He's not Johnson, he's Boris. And I think that popularism that he has, that popular appeal that he has, you know, I think, I think actually, I think in that sense, I think that's going to carry him, that's going to carry him through. And I think some of the journalists, maybe missing that kind of thing about actually what is it about him that, that he can get away with what many people would say are mistakes that he should not be able to get away with. Uh, Damien, um, uh, your man has been uh, uh, traduced uh, and now defended uh, by Ackle, I feel, at least the voters, who, the people who voted for him. Yeah. Um, so Damien, how do you react first uh, to what's been said about uh, Boris Johnson? Well, I think the... I've got to remember, it's not that long ago that he he pulled off something which is almost unprecedented in in modern politics, which is to lead his party to a fourth general election victory in a row by an increased majority, an increased number of seats. I don't think he did that because he has a, is an optimistic personality, which I think people like, and he was focused on getting getting Brexit done. And then, and I think what we saw at the end of last year was a country that had become worn out by a, a gridlock on that issue. And he was someone that would get things done, get things moving. 
And I think those are the qualities people will look for him through this crisis as well. Obviously, he's been through his own personal uh, brush with uh, with coronavirus, and that's you know, I'm sure had a big impact on him. Um, but I, I think when we when we look back at this, and it's hard to know we're not we're not at the end yet, so it's hard to know what how things will look when we look back. But I certainly think if if I'd gone back in, to Westminster in, in March or thinking back to what we were talking about in Westminster in March, what were the things that we were really worried about? I think probably the number one thing we were really worried about was whether the health service would cope. You know, where, you know people kept saying there aren't enough acute beds, there aren't enough ventilators, and yet those issues were, were addressed. And we didn't see here what we saw in um, countries like Italy of people being sent home to die because there was no, there was no, no place to treat them. And if anything, we've had overcapacity in the health service. So that's been one of the most important things we had to get right and that, that got right. I think, you know, it's, as we've talked about already, it's very hard for businesses. It's going to get a lot harder for businesses, but we've probably put in place a world leading series of measures to try and support businesses and jobs as well. And I think in, ultimately the government will be judged on, you know, how it's managed the infection rates, how it's, how it's supported the health service to cope, how we've helped businesses through this period of time. And I, I think, yeah, that as always, when the government's being scrutinized in the level it is like every day during a massive crisis, there'll be a lot of things it hasn't got right and a lot of things it needs to change. But I think we'll look back and say on the really big items that it got, the government basically got the big things right. I, I have to say, watching uh, Boris day after day, I still don't feel that he's completely over it. He looks um, a, a bit drawn on occasion. So, Damien, let me now pursue um, the points you made about social media. I'd like to know more about what you think about that and about whether or not we are fighting, which someone's already referred to here, a battle between mainstream media and the output of social media and whether mainstream can really, in this circumstance, save itself, win back trust and win back an audience. Thank you. Um, so I think that I'd like to start off by actually looking at the phrase mainstream media, because it sort of suggests that kind of non-mainstream media is somehow niche. Uh, and yet let's, let's, when you look at the latest Ofcom data on where people get news and information from, where do people spend their time? What are their eyeballs looking at? Well, we, we see from that, 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 that data that for people under the age of 35 in this country, that the third most popular channel for content is YouTube. The fourth most popular is Netflix. And if you look at this for, so that's for, sorry, that for, that's for all adults. So for all adults, the third most popular is YouTube, fourth most popular Netflix, for the under 35, YouTube is by far, far the biggest. People are spending more and more time engaged in media, which may have been considered to be niche or small a, a decade ago, but is now actually principally mainstream media. You know, for, for people under the age of 40, the term mainstream media probably should be applied to YouTube more than any other service that's out there because that is capturing more of their attention and that shift is continuing. Well, I think the, and we see before we get start to look at, look at news as well, we see that's also having a profound impact. You know, advertising money is going to the place where the customers are. So it is going away from print and it's going away from television and it is going into these online platforms and channels. We still have a regulatory system for media, which is based on the pre-internet world. Now, I can, if I, if I bring a community radio station in my constituency, uh, I'd have to have a license for it from Ofcom. I have, there's a code of conduct I have to abide by. If I had a YouTube channel with a million subscribers, I don't have to do any of that. Yet why is it that it's, I'm considered to be a broadcaster if I'm broadcasting through, you know, through wires and signals, but if I'm doing it on the internet, I'm not. And yet the end product is, is the same. So I think we have to recognize that um, the, mainstream, the mainstream is where the people are and the people are changing where they're going and they're increasingly on social media. And it creates a big, big challenge for us about how we impose a sense of responsibility for the people that have this power. I believe in freedom of speech, but I don't think the freedom of speech is the same thing as freedom of reach. You know, I might have the, the right to post what I want on my social media page, but do I have the right to broadcast that to millions of people multiple times a day? Do I have the right to use the algorithms of social media to target people with specific messages so that they largely see more and more of the same things and the things I want them to see? Uh, and that the news they consume is based in a bubble that is increasingly difficult for people outside of that bubble to penetrate. Is that, is that what we want the ecology of news to be like? Because that is what 
social media is creating for very many people. I think there is alongside that a real danger then that what we consider news to be becomes a premium product. It becomes a product for people that are prepared to buy a newspaper or more likely pay it, prepared to pay a subscription fee uh, to a new service. It becomes a product um, you know, that the people that wish to continue buying a, a BBC license, license are prepared to get from the BBC. But other people may say, well, you know, I'm, I actually, I value my Netflix subscription more than I do the BBC and I get my news from social media. So I don't really, I don't need this other stuff. And that would be a, an alarming place to be because it would take many people out of the news market altogether. And my concern about the sort of sinister nature of the attacks on mainstream media is I think that's what some people want. They want to push the, um, the criticism that comes from trained journalists, trained experts, scrutinizing, questioning, pushing and probing. Um, they, don't want that, they don't want people to see that. They want them to, they want a, a general picture of, of uncertainty and lack of clarity and lack of authority coming from, from the media. And when you look and you analyze at uh, disinformation and tactics of disinformation, the primary motivation that comes, I think a lot of that, is not an attempt to prove a counterfactual, not an attempt to prove something that isn't true is true, but to leave people in a position where they don't know what to believe anymore. Uh, and they don't trust the media, the mainstream media, they don't trust the government, they don't trust public bodies and authorities, they just don't know what to believe. And some people, well, a lot of people say to me, well, you know, is this really true? Uh, surely people don't believe all this rubbish that you see uh, on the internet. Well, you look at some of the research that's been done during coronavirus, you'll see quite high numbers of people that believe that the virus was you know, synthetically created in a laboratory and released. A third of people believe that to be the case. You know, we've seen uh, in this country, um, and indeed some, some people, someone, someone's been convicted now of attacking a, um, a mobile phone mask because they believe that 5G mobile signals were the cause of coronavirus. The telecom engineers have been abused in the streets. But you go to India and you see there, you know, people have, there have been, a, there have been attacks orchestrated on minority communities uh, in India because they have been labeled as being likely spreaders of the virus and, and, and the disease. And that's been done through networks or WhatsApp accounts. And that's how people are getting their news uh, and information. And so we should be concerned about that and the impact this is having. It's interesting looking at other issues coming would, together. Would you be, can I just interrupt there? Would you be in favour then of some of these kinds of interventions from Facebook to censor posts? You know, people that say, well, you know, 5G gives you, um, gives you the coronavirus or, uh, and so on. In other words, we, are, you, are you looking for intervention uh, in the postings on social media? Yes, I am. And, and I think what's interesting is we're starting to see that in a way we didn't do before. And I think that's because we're, this is the first major public health emergency of, in the age of social media. And I think it's, it's leading the social media companies, I think, to recognise that um, speech can cause physical harm. Uh, and, that, uh, and, and, you know, it can lead to someone taking a, 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 a medicine that taking, taking a drug that could hurt them rather than cure them. It could lead them to believing something is the cause of something that say 5G is the cause of coronavirus and therefore not worrying about the medical reasons why the virus spreads. And it, they're starting to take interventions closing down accounts. I thought it was very interesting that they shut down, Facebook shut down um, David Icke's page. Um, mm -hmm. YouTube shut down his channel as well. I don't think they'd have taken those decisions six months ago. So I think, I think there's a recognition there. But you know, we've, there's this raging debate in America now about Donald Trump uh, and his messages on Twitter. So if, if he's saying something, which you know, Twitter believe is actually a message designed to su suppress voter turnout um, or provoke harm, uh, could, could cause um, violent acts to be committed. Certainly his reference about looting and shooting in relation to the, um, the current uh, public disturbances, um, then actually you know, does, a, does a platform have a right to intervene there and say, actually, we think this is dangerous. You know, we think you're causing harm and Twitter have done it, Facebook haven't. But this, okay. this is where this debate is going now. But at the, at the heart of it, I believe, is that you know, if you're a publisher, if you're a news publisher, you get things right, you get things wrong. People like what you say, they don't like what we say. No, no one is perfect. But ultimately, you put your name on what you do. There is a liability that goes with that. Ultimately, there are sanctions that could be applied to you. That doesn't exist for social media, and it doesn't even really exist for Mark Zuckerberg, you know, because they don't have liability. They have immunity. They stand back and say, well, this bad thing's happened on our platform, but it wasn't done by us. It was done by the person that posted it. And, you know, therefore, you can't hold us responsible for it. Okay. And that, that, that's what's got to start to change. Sure. 
I'm going to ask you for a, for a really quick answer to this. Sure. Would, would, uh, uh, taking the subject uh, somewhat differently, would you be in favour of a Silicon Valley subsidy to legacy media to keep it going or a, a government subsidy uh, to keep legacy media going? In other words, to keep publishing in print, money is required. Should it come from the government or Silicon Valley or both? May require a bit of both. Um, there's already some support, effectively top licensing, top, effectively a form of top slicing of the BBC license fee to support journalism and news gathering. Um, I, the approach I'm very interested in at the moment is the approach being taken in Australia, where there is an attempt now to set, almost like set a rate card for news creators and providers for what they should be compensated when their content is distributed through social media. So they, you know, their, their content is being used to attract audiences and attract attention on social media. They get very little of anything back for that. And in Australia, they're trying, they're trying to fix that by establishing a fixed rate. The tech company should pay the news companies for that. And I think that's, a, I'd like us to look at that very seriously in the UK as well. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to change the direction a bit by coming to Akhil Ahmed. Um, because I want Akhil to, to look at this subject of how uh, the, the uh, coronavirus pandemic drama has been covered uh, in terms of um, uh, black and uh, Muslim uh, people. And I've got a specific question about Muslims coming uh, from one of the viewers as well in a second, Akhil, but I'll let you start mm. off where you plan to go. Yeah, no, thank you. I could have actually talked as a as a non-exec director off in the Advertising Standards Authority. I could have talked to Damien about the issues about uh, advertising as well on that one, but I, I think you're right on this one. In terms of so, in terms of um, COVID nineteen, I mean, it's quite an interesting thing. And actually, obviously, the first death is reported on the first first of January, and and one of the interesting things, which I think uh, we, I particularly people like myself who were sat at home watching it on the news and reading newspapers, was. We was, we, when we first started to see the first deaths coming in, particularly from NHS workers, we were noticing the names and the colour of them. And in, a lot of them seemed to be Muslim and a lot of them seemed to be, um, uh, or we were very diverse. And what was very clear was that, th that, that there, was this, there was no deep analysis of this that was going on on the news at the time or in the newspapers. It just seemed to be happening and it took its time. It was dripping and dripping. And... And I think it was quite, the interesting thing was actually what you saw was in, in, in the social media in terms of diverse people's uses of social media and in diverse press, whether it be the Eastern Eye, for instance, they had an interview with Dr. Chand Nagpal, who's the chair of the BMA, and he was talking about this. And that was before you saw it in The Guardian, and et cetera. And then I don't think it was until around about mid-March. So we're talking a good five to six weeks. We're around about mid-March when... BAME deaths and the whole issue around COVID-19, you know, with regards to BAME deaths and, and the high number of them uh, became, became a bit of a, became a national story. And, and, and I think sometimes it's really important to actually understand, you know, what that means and actually also say what we've seen since has been absolutely fantastic. The coverage with regards to whether it be BAME people in the NHS, whether it regards to um, you know, what, uh, in, uh, asking for inquiries into why BAME people may be more, may be more prevalent, why the deaths are, and, and are more prevalent within them as communities. You know, all of that has gone on. And I think also the impact of things like the BBC Asian Network, you know, an uh, you know it, it have, been, have been fantastic. As a Sky, Sky and ITV's coverage of this has been incredible. So I just wanted to say that the big question is, it took a long time to get there. And I don't want to go over things that I think a lot of people will kind of like guess. But the fact of the matter is, is we know what it is in many, in many, di in many newsrooms, whether it be TV, radio or print, there's not a lot of diversity when it comes to seniority. It's, it's scarce. And there seems little point in discussing that. But, but when you think about it, that does have to change. And of course, alongside that, the, if, if we were seeing inroads into this in the early days before it became a bigger story, in those first five to six weeks, if you were seeing inroads by uh, specialist ethnic media, then it also makes you wonder that maybe this is a moment to think about building a relationship between them and what we would, what we, what we still class as the mainstream media. Um, so there was that. Then there was the other thing as well, which was again we have a good story now in terms of the government briefings where we're seeing diverse journalists and brought and, and media outlets being invited to ask questions. But again, took a long time. 
And for the vast majority of the first couple of months, we had about one or two people of a diverse background who actually asked questions at the government briefings. So you could see there was a, it, there's, a, there's a big thing going on here, which is it wasn't an issue until it became an issue for the mainstream media. And so what I would say is there are a couple of learnings that we can take away from this. You know, one is that lack of seniority in diversity, in the diversity with regards to newsrooms. It, you know, it meant that the story wasn't picked up quick enough. Uh, the specialist ethnic media, there needs to be a way of, of engaging with them because if they can have those in, if they have that ability that we may not have then effectively do something with that. Uh, quality reporting that we've seen from the likes of Inzaman Rashid and Ashish Joshi or Sky News in particular um, shows that these may these are not niche stories. They're actually fantastic. They've led the bulletins on ITV, BBC, Sky, etc. So there says that there is something in this that we shouldn't, they were initially, I bet, were dismissed as they may not appeal to the wider audience. Clearly, we've shown that's not the case. Um, interesting with the BBC Asian Network, the use of foreign language messaging, that's an interesting one as well. If you know me, they had all the broadcast, all the news readers saying messages about stay at home, etc. And in, in the kind of in, in Bengali, in Hindi, in Punjabi, or do whatever. And what that shows is that actually there is this disconnect between people who think they know what the what people need and what people really need. And actually, you know, in, in many media circles, the fact of the matter is, you know, someone like me is really boring because I'll tell them this and they don't want to hear it. They'll, they'll want to hear from the person that tells them everything's shiny and new. The fact of the matter is, as those messages showed, people still, there are still people who don't speak English well enough and they still need this. So we still need to do that. And then this, what I wanted to do was actually have just, uh, just move on to something about Muslims, which I think that we, we've been asked this question, but it's actually, a, it's a different take on it, which is, during COVID-19, there's two things that have happened. One is we've seen that a lot of Muslims work within the NHS and that's why they died. And you'd hope that that has changed some of people's reactions to it. I'm not particularly quite sure if that is the case, but I think it did initially when we had a few at the, uh, at the start. But what we have actually seen is a bit of an obsession with Muslims uh, and with Ramadan during this whole thing. And, and, and initially what it was, it was basically, will Muslims stay at home during Ramadan? Will they behave themselves during Ramadan? And the initial story, which is in the Sunday Times, I think was fair enough because it was a question to be asked. It was answered and that should have been the end of it. But it just went on. And I've made this joke but before and I'll make it again, which is Mecca was closed. If Mecca was closed, it doesn't take a genius to figure out a mosque in Bolton might be closed. So it, as a question, I don't understand why newspapers, broadcasters, foreign media, even our own government went on and on and on about it when Muslims themselves weren't even talking about it. And if you compare that to the VE Day celebrations, you know, I was sat at home watching it and thinking camera should, the camera should be panning away from these people. There's, they're, not, they're not social distancing. It, this is, we, it, we are condoning this by actually showing it live and not actually questioning it. You compare that to the kind of commentaries that we've seen about Muslims and some wags were saying that maybe to celebrate Eid, they should rebrand it as VEE Day, whatever, because you'll get away with uh, the conga, et cetera, with a few kind of like you know, Union Jack bunting, because that doesn't seem to be a problem. And I think a lot of this is that this obsession then went into another, there's an obscure element to this, which I mean, is quite a funny one in one respect, which is there seem to be on lots of websites, BBC News website, even New York Times, et cetera, Whenever they wanted to have, an, whenever there was, there was lots of images about COVID-19, lots of stories, there'd be imagery would be of a Muslim. And the funniest one was, I think it was from the New York Times, where they had talked about COVID cases in Europe, and it was the interior of a mosque. And you think, what was going on? There's a guy called Mikdad Versi, who's at the Muslim Council of Britain, who diligently goes around dealing with this. And, you know, we all know who he is, and he's a pain for some people, but a, a, great, a great guy for the other ones. And he's gone along and pointed out these ridiculous images that have been used. And it got to the stage where I actually emailed him once and said, I think they're just doing this to wind you up now, Mick, because <laughs> there is no reason to have these kinds of cases. Now, we can, I laugh and we all laugh, but what it does is it shows that there is this ridiculous obsession with Muslims. It clearly is a clickbait thing going on. And when I, so when I think, when the, to answer that question about if we've, somebody's said about whether or not Muslim, the representation and portrayal of Muslims might be better, I think it was for a particular period when people were really feeling strongly about the NHS and we were seeing nurses in hijabs and Muslim men who were doctors or co-workers, et cetera, who were dying and the numbers were there to be seen and their names and their faces gave that story away. But look at the obsession that we still see. 
that Muslims, you know, we even had some celebrities or Z-listers or good ones and us making a video telling Muslims to stay at home during Ramadan. That was a non-story. And that the scale of that story shows that I don't think we've gone away from our obsession with them for in the print media and in okay. the TV news media. Thank you, Akal. I don't want to feel I'm cutting you off because I'm being an uh, Islamophobic. No, 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 I got to the end, don't worry. <laughs> can I just say about the Sunday Times starting that story, never forget about media narcissism. The media are obsessed yes. with the media, so they answer the question. We feel we all should be asking that question. That's probably what happened. Let me yeah. change the focus now and go across the waves uh, to David Key Johnson who uh, is going to look at this through the lens, um, I'm wondering whether that's quite the right word, mask or something, of Donald Trump. Tell us about Donald Trump and the, the making of Donald Trump's special COVID-19 contribution to the world. Well, you know, three years before this began, I wrote that if a virus hopscotches around the world on jetliners causing a pandemic, Donald Trump will have no idea what to do. And it's not like we didn't know this was coming. I actually, uh, one of my lectures in college was about, we're going to have another pandemic like the 1918-1920 flu. And we are going to have more of these in the future because as the tundra is melting in the far north, uh, biologists are discovering all sorts of new viruses that human beings have had no contact with for tens of thousands of years. The Arctic is turning out to be teeming with viruses that are new, presumably coming out of uh, melting permafrost areas. So we have to think about this in terms of a long-term future. Uh, in Donald's case, it is sort of extraordinary that despite all of the corruption, the incompetence, the erratic, nutty behavior, all the good journalism that's been done about it, it is this invisible tiny pathogen that may bring him down. And that's because you can't deny the reality of 113,000 dead people, which by the way is above the highest number he said we would have. And the real number is more likely about 140,000 because 113 is only confirmed deaths. And I just wanna make one little interesting point that I think we've missed in the news business. How fascinating, and in America at least, where we have all of these demonstrations about policing issues that I was writing about 40 years ago, police abuse, that we didn't have the necessary PPE for doctors and nurses in America, but by golly, we had abundant riot gear and armored assault vehicles for the police. So we were ready for one and not the other. And that goes to the fact that much of what government does is fundamentally boring. And we tend not to cover it as news because we think of it as routine but when government doesn't do jobs like stockpile things we need to have and gather intelligence on things like where are there uh, uh, infectious diseases spreading in the world, they have horrible consequences. Um, I, I wanna make sure though that we think about the significance of what George Lakoff, the cognitive scientist calls a truth sandwich. We as journalists have made a major mistake throughout this in quoting people like Boris Johnson and uh, the leadership in Iran and elsewhere first, and then critiquing what they say, principally inside the jump page. And of course, only about 15% of readers follow a story after the jump to the inside. Uh, he calls for something called a truth sandwich. So first, as a journalist, you should tell your readers, viewers, or listeners what you're about to be informed of is dubious, false, whatever the right characterization of it is. Then you pretty fully quote Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, whomever else. And then you dissect it because the reader now wants to know, well, what's wrong with that? And I think that is not a perfect, but it is a better measure. And uh, uh, I also think that um, Damien's point is very important, plus that of the piece we had in the beginning. Google and Facebook, particularly Google though, are parasites to the news organizations. They don't contribute to them, but they mightily profit off them. I, I meet people in America all the time, at least before we could freely move around, who would say, oh, I get my news from Google. There's no newsroom at Google. There are no reporters at Google. They just act as parasites. And by the way, that's what the coronavirus is. It's a parasite. It's not even quite a life form. 
So uh, going forward, what I think as journalists we should do, because uh, Philip Barnes has raised this question in the, the chat function, going forward, we need to recognize some things that are going to happen. We're going to have more pandemics in the future, probably even in the lifetimes of all of us with gray hair, the majority of this group. Secondly, uh, we're going to see much greater concentration of ownership of business. And this is the principal problem for all the good things capitalism has done in the world. It tend toward, tends toward monopoly. And we need to have an aggressive uh, instruction program so that people understand monopoly and lack of competition destroys all the benefits of capitalism uh, as Adam Smith taught us in 1776. Uh, so we need to really work against monopolization and the mining of the vast majority of people rather than creating an economy that broadly benefits people. Do you, do you mean, uh, David, by the main monopolization in terms of media? Because uh, especially, you're thinking, especially in media, you're thinking uh, Google and Facebook are heading in that direction. Yeah, I, I wrote a piece when I was with the Los Angeles Times back in the 70s and 80s um, about how we were headed toward having a half a dozen companies control most of the media in the US, which is exactly what's happened. And we were much better off when we had many, many owners with many different perspectives, even though a lot of them were, were nutty people and had strange views and some were good publishers and some were bad. But you know, we have a handful of companies control the radio stations, the television stations, and we need competition. We desperately need competition. The only way we're going to get that is Parliament in Britain, the Congress and state legislatures in the U.S. are going to have to pass laws that break these things up. And, and we need it in news. We need it in accounting firms. Oh, my God, do we need it in accounting firms. And other fundamental reforms. And I hope the coronavirus leads us to rethink a lot of these things about public access, uh, preparation for the future, the role of government, so that we have a healthier and safer, safer society going forward, and we minimize this tendency towards authoritarianism represented very much by Donald Trump, who is a wannabe dictator, as I've been warning people for five years, and finally it's making mainstream news that he's a wannabe dictator. But hasn't, hasn't Donald Trump gone around the media so successfully, now splitting the American public almost in two, making it really difficult for what I called mainstream media um, to actually regain a position in which the people, the mass of the people can trust it? Well, Trump has not grown his audience one bit in these years in which he calls us the enemy of the people. Uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind. He has an absolutely fiercely loyal audience of people who literally believe, as he does of himself, that if he's not a god, he's at least a demigod. And not gog, god. And uh, that audience, I think, is, is pretty solidly going to stay with him, although as the number of people dying from the coronavirus increases, there we're seeing some weakening of that. But on the larger picture, yes, the, we've had in America for more than 40 years a very well-financed attack on honest journalism. They don't waste their time going after Rupert Murdoch's New York Post and Fox News, which are inherently mendacious or Breitbart. They go after the New York Times, where I worked for many years, and the Washington Post and the AP and Bloomberg News. And the reason for that is that there's a very strong authoritarian streak in the US, just as there is in every country of the world by people who really just tell me what to do. I don't wanna be free. I don't wanna live in a democracy. It's too much work. Just tell me what to do and leave me alone. It's why the Singapore police state is so successful as a police state. You know, They have wonderful parks and, and subways and everything else, and, but they're a police state. Uh, uh, and so we need to do a lot of educating of people of why it matters that we have a marketplace of ideas and you invest some of your time in being a citizenship. Democracy does not work unless people decide that they care and they are involved. When I went to college in the 60s and the early 70s, uh, the prevailing theory in America was that the US Constitution was the product of an aristocratic revolt, that democracy required aristocrats at least in the sense of people who had time to think about public issues. And the one good thing I've seen come back is some discussion of an issue I've pushed in America for years uh, that Donald Trump has brought it about. 
in the ancient Greek meaning of the world word, Donald Trump is an idiot. Doesn't mean he's stupid. It means he doesn't care about anything but himself. And in these demonstrations in the streets, I mean, little all white towns of 10,000 people, like the one I used to live in at the Jersey Shore, Ocean City, have had the streets filled with people over the Black Lives Matter movement in the middle of the coronavirus and people wearing masks and practicing social distancing reasonably well for a demonstration. And I think that's an indication that maybe we're going to go through a renaissance of a democracy, the values of the liberties of the people and a, um, a, an opposition to the incredible increased power we keep granting to corporations beyond their purpose, which is to encourage risk-taking to grow the economy. End of story. Okay, thank you very much. I'm always in favor of ren a renaissance. Um, let me just put a quick set of questions then to the rest of the panel. Damien, first, uh, let me ask you, what, what do you think in this situation uh, we think the role of the media should be uh, going forward. This is a question from uh, Deborah Bonetti, who is the chair of the Foreign Press Association, one of our viewers today. She's wondering where we should be going now. Um, sure, it's a great, great question. I mean, on one level, the media fulfills a role in terms of the, the broadcasting of live events. So the BBC has had quite a, in some ways, you know, fulfilled a function because the, I think when the country's worried about something or a problem, it, I think it, just, it sort of gravitates towards the national broadcaster and the idea of the, the shared collective moments of listening to prime minister speak and, and doing things like that. So I think the, a, a media still, when, when there is a national event, be it a crisis or a celebration, the media brings the country together. The other thing, and that, will, and that role is necessary and will continue. Um, and I think we're having a big debate, we'll have a big debate in the next year or so about the role of the BBC and how it's funded uh, and, and so on. The other thing that remains important is investigations. I think you know, the journalism still plays a, a hugely important role in terms of investigative reporting. Indeed, the scrutiny of companies like Facebook and Google is largely driven by, invest, by investigations and whistleblowers are coming forward. And that will remain, uh, that will remain massively important too. Um, I think that the big next challenge will be the, vac the coronavirus vaccine. I think when down, down the line, there'll be a massive anti-vax campaign against it and the media will play a very important role in making sure people have the facts and the truth about that as well. Um, but my concern is that I think whilst the New York Times and the BBC and the Guardian and the Times, uh, London Times will always be there, um, we're seeing a massive hollowing out of other forms of media as well, particularly local media and local news. And I think that is, that is really concerning. And I think the economic shock of the virus is going to hollow out a lot of uh, local and regional news. And that's, that's where we'll need to direct our efforts to make sure that local news gathering, investigations, challenge, still exist because democracy will be much poorer without them. Yes, I agree. And uh, uh, without wishing to plug my own chapter in the book, uh, The Virus and the Media, that's exactly my concern, that the local media will be more affected in Britain uh, than the national. Uh, Paul, let me ask you uh, how you think uh, we should go forward uh, in terms of the media coverage as we emerge out of lockdown, but with many, many months ahead of, uh, of difficulties, I fear. I think your mic is off, Paul. No, I'm not hearing you, I'm afraid. Akil, let me ask you. Right, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, now, sorry, yes, right. we can hear you now, yeah. I'd, I'd like to think, uh, the emphasis is on like to think, but. The COVID crisis, you know, will actually restore to a degree confidence or trust in the mainstream media. Although, of course, sales have gone down and advertising has collapsed, the traffic on the websites has, you know, has, has gone up pretty encouragingly. And I just have to throw in one thing to David. When I knew Trump pretty well back in New York, when the idea of being president was just a distant twinkle in his eye, he, of course, rather courted and adored the mainstream media. We were far, we were far from, the, uh, from the public enemy then. And I wonder if David feels that if Biden wins the, wins the election, then we could see something of a revival in, in trust in the mainstream media. Well, I'll let you ask, answer that, David. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I think that's one of the big unknowns 
uh, is how much damage has been done by Trump and by these, these campaigns that have been financed by the Koch brothers and various uh, right-wing authoritarian interests in America to discredit news. And as someone who's personally been very much a target of these people, I probably have a somewhat jaundiced view about it. There's the, the problem I think is one of how widespread it is. We should be mass media, not elite media. And that's sure. the, get, I mean, get, the one get, thing I can remember nice Trump saying, saying to me was that he was that he hated the idea of the electoral college system and the president should be should be elected by the popular vote. How things change. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Akil, um, let me come to you uh, lastly. I, I, the coincidence of the Black Lives Matter protests following the uh, murder of George Floyd coming at the same time as COVID, I wonder uh, how uh, or whether uh, that's making a difference to the debate and is helpful, in fact, to the cause of uh, BAME people. Um, I think it has made a difference. And actually, it's it was one of the things I would have gone on to mention because it's it definitely there's as I said, I don't think you know, we've had seen some fantastic coverage before the Black Lives Matter ha happened anyway, with regards to the people who've been dying, the, the NHS workers, etc. So there is that. I think if you think about the, the issues around people, the, the, the worry that people have about why isn't this report, why wasn't the report into divert and BAME deaths and, and BAME susceptibility to COVID-19 published? That happened around, that kind of anger and concern happened around the time of the beginning of this particular phase of the Black, Li Black Lives Matter debate. So I think there is definitely some kind of relationship there. You can see that as it is. In terms of actually how, how we're seeing it reported in the new newspapers and on TV, the Black Lives Matter, I think it's been fantastic. There's been some fantastic coverage. And I think you can only say that that's because we were learning lessons as we go along. But the Black Lives Matter thing is so big, it would be hard to ignore anyway. The bigger question is, if you think about the toppling of the statue in the uh, Colson statue in Bristol, you know, that's been a story in Bristol. And there's been a story about the lack of a memorial to slavery in this country for many, many years. I made a we made a film at Channel 4 in 2005, I believe, called The, the Empire Pays Back, which was all about the whole issue around slavery and the bill that we would have for slavery in this country if we ever bothered to pay any of it back. And also we were, it, the film ends with a whole, with the whole question of a need for a memorial. Now you could argue because of that lack of diversity and seniority, that hasn't been a story. No one's been bothered about that. So in actual fact, we, what, what we were doing is we're, we're reporting the story much better now in terms of what's going on on the streets or what's going on in America, what's going on here. But the depth to the story, which has been going on for many, many years, we've not really understood. And I think that the Colston thing that, that in Bristol really kind of like brings that home, which is, you know, the, the, it, it was an event, it had to be covered. It was covered brilliantly. You've seen a few really interesting articles. The Guardian had, uh, David Olusogo wrote some, a really interesting piece on it as well. And he's been on TV and he's been everywhere talking about it because he really knows this subject inside out. So this, these are all positives. I'm just saying, this isn't a new story. We're only finding it now because of what's happening because of the bigger picture. This has been a story for a long time. So that's the lesson we need to learn, which is to listen to people who are telling you these things and not just do really well when you have to react to a big event on, that's happening in front of you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all four of you as we bring this to a close. Uh, Paul Conyu, David Key Johnson, Damian Collins, and you, Ackle. Uh, and I want to urge everyone who's watching to buy uh, the virus and the media. Uh, it is, uh, an, it's a wonderfully quick read. Um, I was through it in about 20 minutes and went back again, but there's lots of interesting material in there. Now, of course I would say that, wouldn't I? Uh, but anyway, it is good. So thank you to my panel. Uh, thank you to all for watching. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to find this on YouTube uh, at a later date, uh, probably within a week or so. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>